My next two guests have written two of the most relevant books for helping us understand just what is happening to our country. Anne Applebaum's latest is Twilight of Democracy, The Seductive Lure of Authoritarianism. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning historian and a staff writer at The Atlantic. Ezra Klein is the author of Why We're Polarized. He's a columnist for The New York Times starting this week, actually. Um, Ezra, let me ask you, uh, everyone is talking about how the people who rioted, the people who stormed the Capitol, should be held accountable, should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. You wrote something interesting saying, well, that shouldn't really be our focus. Explain why. Yeah, so it is not that they shouldn't be held accountable. They absolutely should. But we should remember that the real villains here are the people who fooled them. They are Marx. They were conned. And they were not conned by random folks on the street. The president of the United States told them the election had been stolen, that electoral politics had failed, had been made a mockery of, that a landslide had been taken from them. And he wasn't alone. He was joined by the House Minority Leader, by more than a dozen Republican U.S. senators, by more than 100 U.S. congressmen, by every major conservative talk radio host, by the primetime lineup of Fox News. So these people were told that a tremendous crime had been committed. And the only thing for patriots do, to do was to mass and then to do something. Something was often left vague, although not always. President Trump saying, come on January 6th, it will be wild, isn't all that vague. So my concern or my argument here is not that we should not be prosecuting people who broke into the Capitol and potentially wanted to massacre U.S. members of Congress. Of course we should. But we can't only prosecute the weak and avoid accountability for the strong. We can't only prosecute those who can hit with the law while the powerful are protected by politics. And so not just Donald Trump, but Ted Cruz and John Hawley and, and Hawley and all these other folks get off because it would be too divisive to do anything uh, in terms of their accountability as well. Yeah, and as you point out, people often forget the, the ranking member, uh, Republican member in the United States Congress, Kevin McCarthy, was a fully paid up member of the wild conspiracy mm -hmm. theories on this front. Um, and I want to ask you about that, this dynamic that, uh, that uh, Ezra just described, where so many Republicans went along with Trump's crazy conspiracy theories and lies because they thought it was kind of a, a, a cost-free way for them to pander to his base. Uh, what could come of it? They were humoring him. And of course, what we've seen is that this kind of rhetoric does have a cost, that words are not empty, that you actually influenced a whole bunch of people, millions maybe, and certainly the, the tens of thousands who came to Washington. And you talk about exactly this phenomenon of the people who, uh, who get seduced by authoritarian, uh, authoritarianism, not because they believe the ideology, but because they are so covetous of the power, being close to power. One of the oddities of the modern Republican Party is that it is very divided. But the divide is not ideological in any traditional sense. It's not like there's a left wing and a right wing or a liberal and a conservative wing of the modern Republican Party. What we now have is a part of the party that's still dedicated to reality, to using politics to solve problems, and another part of the party that has exactly, as you say, um, done a deal with the devil and decided that politics is about lying and it's about creating an alternative reality for certain kinds of voters to live in, for you know, particularly gullible, um, particularly angry people to be attracted to and, and, and to live in. Um, and that, that and, and those politicians are not interested anymore in politics. They're interested in conspiracy theory. They're interested in culture wars. Um, they're interested in whipping up anger on social media and, and in other forms of media and in leading people down that path. And the decision, the argument within the party now is a really strange one. Um, as I said, who wins? Is it going to be reality? Is it return to politics, not even as normal, but just as functional? Um, or is a part of the party going to go off in that direction in, in the interest of its own power and in pursuit of anti-democratic goals? Um, you know, democracy requires, as you yourself have written, not just elections and not just institutions, but it requires norms and morality. Um, it requires all kinds of rules. Um, and it also requires a fact-based, evidence-based um, reality that people can talk about and debate. And without that, we can't have democracy. It just doesn't function. 
Ezra, so if you take what Anne was describing and you, you, we confront the reality for the Republican Party that now the White House, the Senate, and, Congre and, and the House of Representatives are all controlled by the Democrats and their view elite cultural institutions are controlled by Democrats, they are going to feel more like their world is slipping away. And I've, I've, I've always thought that to understand America now or that part of America, this wonderful book by a German historian called The Politics of Cultural Despair, this sense that your world is disappearing. Won't they become, isn't there a danger that they become more uh, fanatical because they think that their, their world is slipping away? There isn't just a danger, there's a near certainty. So I think you need to look at this moment as one of the most dangerous we're facing. As Anne says, the Republican Party is divided. Most people are not going to storm the Capitol. Most people are not going to become violent. But for those who are truly committed to Trumpism as both an ideological and a fantastical project, right, as this fantasy that you could regain total control over the country, to see it rupture, to see the conspiracies like QAnon rupture, to see simply Donald Trump's words rupture, to be told that Mike Pence could stop this great crime, and then he doesn't. It is in that moment of rupture, that epistemic break, that people can go, frankly, a little bit nuts. And we are seeing it now, right? That is why this is happening now. The storming of the Capitol happened now, because all these things that people were expecting would happen, that there was some great plan behind it, or Donald Trump wasn't really going to lose, the states were not going to send those electoral college votes, it didn't happen. So what you may get is a Republican Party where much of it is, some of it is sort of normal. Some of it is what I would call abnormal anti-system, um, but it's not violent insurrectionist. But then there is a, a core that is millions of people that is on the border or is violent insurrectionist. And the weaker they get, the more dangerous they become. The more they feel is being taken from them, the more is justified in response. The greater the crime, um, the more is demanded of patriots in, in, in reply. And that is, again, I, I continuously want to focus my commentary here on the Republicans who operate in that middle space, the Ted Cruz's, the Hollies, et cetera, because they're the ones creating the permission structure. They may not themselves support violence or say they don't, but so long as they're telling um, those folks over to even their right that what they believe has happened, this has been taken, this has been taken from them, this is a totalitarian society run by big tech and the left, they are justifying the worldview that leads quite logically to these kinds of acts. All right, stay with us next, so watch.